Hello and welcome to an adventure. <laughs> Hi everybody, I'm Anthony Wright Day Hernandez, Community Collections Archivist here at Virginia Tech, and this is Archival Adventures. Uh, welcome to the stream. Um, hopefully you can hear me okay. I'm spiking. Really? I... I honestly, I worked really hard at trying to make it work properly today. It's super loud and distorted. Okay, um, in that case, is this better? Please do let me know. Uh, I'm, I'm talking a bit, please let me know. It, does that adjustment help out? Is the audio better? Sounds the same to you, better for Hannah. I will bump it down even more. Um, <clears throat> let's see, uh, what about here? I honestly, I did adjust this before I went live, so I don't, I don't really understand why, but I mean, this is par for the course. So uh, is this better now? I can also try other things. I'm still, still peaking a little bit, but not nearly as often. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't really understand why it's so different than when I was testing it. So, um, okay, sounds good now, according to Hannah. Please let me know, everybody else, if, uh, please let me know. Ah, okay. Yeah, no, I just, I, I went over and moved the slider down but I tested beforehand and it all seemed good and whatever. Uh, you're the ones that have to listen to it, so I want to make sure it works for you. I just hope I don't have to start every stream that way. Because, um, yeah, someday, someday I will know where I should set things. Um, uh, theoretically. Anyway, uh, the audio is hard. Oh, uh, just audio in general is hard. Yeah, it is, and I don't really know. I can take a picture of the presets, and hopefully in the future, if I set them to the same thing, I'll get similar results. But sometimes that just doesn't seem to, to work out. Anyway, um, let, me, let me try this from the top. Welcome to an adventure. I'm Anthony Wright Day Hernandez, Community Collections Archivist here at Virginia Tech, and this is Archival Adventures. Uh, <laughs> most of the people, at least the people who have been chatting, um, are on the Rogan 27 channel. That's because uh, my uh, show actually goes out weekly to two channels, to uh, the Libraries channel, which is twitch.tv slash VTUL Studios, and to my personal channel, which is twitch.tv slash Rogan27. Um, and you know, I did that once by accident, and more people showed up on my personal channel, and it's fine <clears throat> because I just enjoy sharing the things with y'all. Um, so today we're actually going to be looking at a collection we've seen before but I have different boxes. Um, and it is a collection of papers from a test pilot and um, aviation accident investigator. Uh, crash investigator, that, that's the words. Um, <laughs> named uh, Melvin Goff. And so uh, that is, um, that's what we're gonna be looking at shortly. Uh, but yes, thank you so much, Hannah, for uh, dropping the finding aid there in the chats. 
Um, I have boxes 3, 5, 9, 10, 16, and 22. So if you see something listed on the finding aid for any of those boxes that you particularly want to see, make sure you let me know. And we we have the Whimsies arriving on the Rogan 27 channel. Welcome, Eric. Welcome, Whimsies. Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome in Raiders. Rykar, thank you so much for the resubscription. 25 months. It's hard to believe it's been 25 months. Um, but yes, hello, 16-bit Eric. Uh, if we can get a shout out for Eric, that would be wonderful. Um, Eric is just the best of people and a wonderful TTRPG uh, game master um, who is one of the founders of the Stream Punks and, um, you know, just, just an all around lovely community. Uh, you should definitely give a follow over there if you happen to not be. Um, yeah, Eagle Sight, my voice <clears throat> is stronger today. Uh, oh, time 628, thank you for the follow. Um, I should probably move us, move us along, but welcome in Raiders. Uh, if you're new here, uh, I am Rogan27. Um, this show is uh, one that I do from work, um, where I am the Community Collections Archivist at Virginia Tech, and uh, we'll be looking at materials from the archives. Uh, today we're looking at a collection of materials from a test pilot um, and crash uh, investigator. Um, most of the materials are closer to the beginning of the 20th century uh, for the test pilot materials, and there's some pretty interesting things. I know for a fact that the boxes I have today include um, uh, the Spruce Goose and an early helicopter and some other things like that. So um, <clears throat> all of that is available to be looked at on stream today. Um, hi, DJ Phoenix. Uh, and want to be high. Um, but before we actually get to the aviation materials, um, there is a tradition that I want to make sure that we uphold, um, <clears throat> which is at the top of stream, um, I read through the land acknowledgement and labor recognition for the institution that owns all of these materials. Um, when I went to pull it up today, the site where I used to share it from was a 404. Um, and so I went looking and this is slightly longer than what we've been looking at. So uh, this will be the first time I read it. I have updated the Mubot command, uh, so it points to this now. Uh, Virginia Tech acknowledges that we live and work on the Tudelo and Monacan people's homeland and we recognize their continued relationships with their lands and waterways. We further acknowledge that the Morrill Land Grant College Act of 1862 enabled the Commonwealth of Virginia to finance and found Virginia Tech through the forced removal of Native nations from their lands in Western territories. We understand that honoring Native peoples without explicit material commitments falls short of our institutional responsibilities. Through sustained, transparent, and meaningful engagement with the Tudelo and Monacan peoples and other Native nations, we commit to changing the trajectory of Virginia Tech's history by increasing indigenous, indigenous student, staff, and faculty recruitment and retention, diversifying course offerings, and meeting the growing needs of all Virginia tribes and supporting their sovereignty. Labor recognition, uh, Virginia Tech acknowledges that its Blacksburg campus sits partly on land that was previously the site of the Smithfield and Solitude plantations, owned by members of the Preston family. Between the 1770s and the 1860s, the Prestons and other local white families that owned parcels of what became Virginia Tech also owned hundreds of enslaved people. Uh, we acknowledge that enslaved black people generated wealth that financed the predecessor institution to Virginia Tech, the Preston and Olin Institute, and they also worked on construction of its building. Not until 1953, however, was the first black student permitted to enroll. Through inclusive VT, the institutional and individual commitment to Prosim that I may serve, in the spirit of community diversity and excellence, we commit to advancing a more diverse, equitable, and inclusive community. So those are a bit <clears throat> expanded. Um, I, I suspect that this new version probably launched this Monday with the start of classes, and I just missed a note saying that it had been updated. Um, 
I ultimately think this is better, especially with regard to the labor recognition. I think it could use a little bit more work personally uh, with regard to the labor recognition and um, some of how it's phrased, but um, these have continued to evolve over time. And uh, every, every time they've evolved, they've gotten better. Um, so I think it, as always, is important that we pay attention to them um, because both of them have something to do with the history of this institution. And since we're looking at archives, um, history is important. Um, and they also make commitments, especially the land acknowledgement makes commitments regarding uh, meeting needs of a community. So I think it's important that we pay attention. Um, as far as what we're going to be looking at today, uh, we are looking at the papers of Melvin Goff, uh, who was born in Washington, D.C. in 1906. Uh, he got a Bachelor of Engineering degree in Mechanical Engineering at Johns Hopkins University in 1926. And then he began working at the Langley Aeronautical Laboratory of the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics, which eventually became NASA. Um, from 1926 to 1958, Goff was successively an engineer, a test pilot, a chief test pilot, and then chief of flight research at the NACA Langley, which um, <laughs> it, it goes on to say, uh, when the NACA became NASA in 1958, Goff transferred to Cape Canaveral, where he was director of NASA operations at the Atlantic Missile Range for two years, and then in 1960, he became director of the Bureau of Safety for the Civil Aeronautics Board, uh, where he got involved with FAA and uh, crash investigation. Um, most of what I have pulled relates to his time as test pilot. I do believe I have some of the NACA or NASA materials, uh, as well as some crash investigation materials, um, as noted in the uh, Finding Aid Command, I have boxes 3, 5, 9, 10, 16, and 22 here today. So if you see something um, on this Finding Aid, uh, down in this containers list, where it gives just like a subject, um, if you see something in box 3, 5, 9, 10, 16, or 22, that you particularly want to see, do let me know. Um, I'll show you how to read this here. Uh, hang on, it's gonna scroll by really fast. Um, so, if you're scanning through uh, this, where it says box folder, three, folder 17, this, um, this means it's box three, folder 17. So anything with this box folder three, um, that, would, that would be box three, which I have here. Um, and here you can see box folder, or box three, folder 15, the Kellett YG-1B Auto Gyro. Uh, the Auto Gyro is an early helicopter. Um, I'm particularly interested in looking at the stuff on the Auto Gyro, but there might be something that you see on there that doesn't jump out to me that you would find particularly interesting. Do let me know, because I'll pull it out and we'll look at it. <clears throat> Sayuri, I don't know where you're located. Um, I know the land and the land acknowledgement, and then the labor acknowledgement um, later on. Uh, land acknowledgements started, e at least as far as I'm aware, um, in Canada as a. Um, a thing that governments and educational institutions were doing in Canada. And then um, over time, they started to move into the United States, especially in educational institutions. Um, so uh, I think it's something that you might see more of over time. Um, I think it would be particularly interesting to see what they look like in places like the United Kingdom or Germany, um, and actually paying attention to the indigenous populations that were there um, that we honestly don't know a whole lot about because their entire culture was wiped out. But those are narratives that we don't often hear. 
box 320 uh, folder 24 so i i that's more of a i'm curious to see what those statements would look like and whether acknowledging those communities actually like i don't even know if those communities exist anymore as coherent communities um or if they've been so distorted by time and uh, social impact that that they just don't exist anymore. Let's see, uh, box three, folder 24, flying qualities correlation of the P40 XSBA1 XTBF1 P36A, is that, that's the, the folder? Apparently the, I don't see folder numbers. Oh, no, that one has a folder number. Oh, very helpfully, the folder numbers are written on. I'll show you in a second. The folder numbers are not written where they normally are, and they're harder to find. Um, so I, I pulled that one. I'm going to find that auto gyro as well, because I'm interested in that one. Um, Kellett YG1B auto gyro. Oof. Okay. I have accidentally scrolled the chat. Here we go. Uh, so let's start with um, box three folder 24 uh, that DJ Phoenix requested to see. The flying qualities correlation P40 XSBA1 XTBF1 P36A. To me, most of that means nothing. So that probably means I'm going to learn something. Um, <clears throat> let's see. Evaluation and prediction of airplane flying qualities, accumulation of data for numerous airplanes. Adoption of procedures, survey of problem, preliminary trial of method, uh, NACA, which I've already forgotten what NACA stands for. Um, I know it's the precursor to NASA. Uh, where'd it go? The National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics. Um, okay, measurements of flying qualities of numerous airplanes. Okay, two specifications for satisfactory flying qualities. A, analysis of accumulated data, and B, suggested requirements for satisfactory flying qualities. Looks like date on this is uh, 1940 to 1943, um, according to the folder. Uh, three, prediction of the P-30 and P-36 were World War II fighters. Okay. Oh, and Puddleglum, you asked the question right around the same time that I went and looked. Um, the, the folder is labeled as being, uh, the documents within are from 1940 to 1943. Flying qualities from model data, tunnel tests required, procedure for interpreting tunnel data, correlation between predictions and behavior in flight. Okay, we have the aileron characteristics of the P-40. Uh, what does, I keep, I love that I now have a mouse and I can control some things, uh, but I keep grabbing the mouse to try and control this other machine. Um, Cause I didn't know what a P-40 looked like. It is the Curtis P-40 Warhawk. Um, can I just zoom in, please? No. Stop. Open image. I'm, I'm getting an image of one from, um, the, from Wikipedia so that we can... Um, but there's a lot of info about World War II aircraft in this collection, so um, don't apologize, DJ Phoenix.
This is the P40, yeah. Um, but I wanted to be able to show you a picture of the aircraft that they're talking about. So um, this picture is from Wikipedia. Uh, that is a Curtis P-40 Warhawk. So that is the kind of airplane that this first report is about. Um, So flying qualities, correlation, aileron characteristics, P40. Uh, the, so total aileron deflection. I don't know what PB over 2V is. Uh, if, if people understand some of this, feel free to jump in and like share. Otherwise, I will attempt to do a little bit of poking on the internet to at least be able to read the chart. Pilots like to talk about roll rates in terms of degrees per second, but engineers use instead a figure called uh, PB over 2V, or the helix angle. The symbol P stands for the roll rate in radians per second. A radian is 57.3 degrees, B is the wingspan, and V is the true airspeed in the same units as were used to measure the span. Thus, an airplane with a 30-foot wingspan traveling at 300 feet per second and rolling at 114.6 degrees or two radians per second would have a helix angle of two times 30 divided by two times 300, or 0 0.10. Um, thank you, Flying Magazine, and uh, your website. I read the explanation. I don't think I really understood the explanation, but it has something to do with um, uh, how much roll uh, the ailerons are providing. So um, apparently the solid line is in flight and the dotted line is tests done in a wind tunnel. Um, interesting, the wind tunnel it seems to be a much more flat uh, curve. and in flight, I mean, it's not a huge variance, but whatever. I don't, I don't understand the chart really, but that's because there's a lot of maths involved that I would need, I would need a lot more time to understand these maths, <laughs> personally. Um, apparently though, the second one here, the total aileron deflection is uh, stick force in pounds. So that is going to be how much you move the stick and its effect. What exactly, okay, here's, here's a great question for you. We're looking at an aeronautical collection, but what are the ailerons? If anybody knows. Oh, okay, so the ailerons are gonna be like the flaps at the farthest edge of the wing, it looks like. Like they're the, the last ones, the, like all the way at the end of the wing. They help steer the plane. Yeah. Yeah, I just Googled aileron to find out, and it's like, they've got flaps, and the flaps are the things that move up and down near the fuselage, which is the body of the plane. And then the ailerons are the ones that move up and down toward the end of the wing. Um, so that's interesting. Okay. Uh, I always learn. This is, that's why this is marked as educational. Partly because I learn. Uh, flying qualities correlation. Uh, sidestep characteristics. Or si 
sidestep, side slip characteristics. Um, when a plane banks left or right, the ailerons help control the angle of the turn. Thank you, DJ Phoenix. Um, okay, so let's see. Control deflections uh, down or left, up or right. Angle of bank left and right. Uh, so angle of side slip. Okay, so this is, um, when using the rudder and the ailerons to control the, control the, to steer the plane, this is, um, talking about how, how much side slip, how much, uh, does the plane shift left or right? as the steering happens. Like, I'm assuming this is not, like this is, side slip to me reads as unintentional movement. Like, as you're using these tools to try and steer, how much to one side or the other does the plane shift unintentionally? And it looks like it's, it doesn't slip very much at all. I don't know what the units are, the units of measure, um, but like the top chart only goes from negative 20 to 20, uh, and the bottom chart only goes from negative 10 to 10. Um, so there can't be a lot of deflection. Unless one is a very large unit in whatever measurement system. Um, which is possible, I guess. Let's see, flying quant qualities, correlation, longitudinal stability, stick fixed, NP percent MAC. C sub L equals one. I don't know what C sub L is. If anybody does, but, uh, Yeah, I, I don't know what most of this means, which is fine. I don't have to know. If somebody does know and wants to explain to us, that's fine. What I take from this, not knowing the math involved, is that um, so as, as was defined before, um, the difference between behavior in the wind tunnel and behavior in flight is very minimal, which means um, that the plane is behaving the way it's intended to, that that's what I take from it. Like, if it was behaving very differently in flight than in the testing tunnel, that would be a problem. There's some variation in real world circumstances versus the wind tunnel where it's tested, but it's minimal. That's what I'm getting from the charts. Being somebody who does not know how to fly a plane, does not know exactly what these measurements actually mean or uh, and has never encountered the the maths involved before um, that's that's about all I, I could take away from it this is a elevator angle required to land for the p36a so full deflection would be 28 degrees meaning um, the flaps or the elevators uh, would, if they're extended fully, they extend out to 28 degrees. In order to land the P36A, it looks like you start with the elevators just above 20 degrees. Does, what I'm not sure of is, does this mean that 
or no? So landing speed. I'm confused. I, I, I am now confused. Landing speed. It seems like you have to adjust the angle as the speed changes. And so if you're starting at over 120 miles per hour, your angle is down somewhere around three or four degrees. And then as you slow down, you slowly go until you end up just above 20 degrees. But I don't know if that's actually what it means. If anybody does know, as always, please tell me. And we have some handwritten, hand-drawn charts of some of this flying qualities correlation. This is those side slip charts that we saw. This is kind of cool, actually. Okay, so this is the chart that we were just looking at, the elevator angle, hand drawn. It's the same chart. And it says, all lettering half inch unless noted. And all of the lettering is half an inch tall. Interesting. Interesting, interesting. I don't know. I don't think I have any, but this is all like test pilot stuff. This is reports on the behavior of the plane. So I don't have, um, what I don't have here is like lots of stuff about the P-40, et cetera, specifically, like, like other than like test results. But you know, that's kind of expected of test pilot stuff. I think this is all really neat. Um, Okay, so next I have uh, the folder I said I was interested in, um, which is folder 15. 1938, the Kellett YG-1B Auto Gyro. It says report. I don't know what that report is going to be. I have not looked in the folder. I just know that I'm curious about the Auto Gyro, which was an early helicopter. Um, I don't believe there's an, oh, oh no, no. Auto Gyro is not a helicopter. Is it? I thought it was. Wait, no. Yeah, no it is. Isn't it? Uh, sorry, I saw pictures and they were not helicopters. Hang on. I know, the auto gyro is like a helicopter. I'm gonna find a picture. Yes. I don't know why I second guessed myself. It's because uh, as as is noted in some of the, um, uh, stream tags on my personal channel, uh, it's the ADHD. Um, Kellett, YG1B. I do like that most of these, it's fairly easy to find an image of them. Heck, this one even has an image from uh, one in a museum. Um, it's in color, which not necessarily something, like we weren't guaranteed to find a color image of a, an old vehicle. It's a little bit blurry, but it'll give you the sense of what this machine is. Um, let me switch over real quick, and again, I'm just pulling images from Wikipedia. 
Um, that is a Kellett YG-1B autogyro. Like I said, it's a blurry image, but um, you can see it's an early helicopter. Looks like a, a plain fuselage with propellers attached on the front. Um, it does not look safe. It looks incredibly dangerous. Like, there's nothing between the pilot and the, and the propellers. So, that is what uh, the documents we're looking at are about. Like a plane with helicopter blades on top. Yes, you're right, Wannabe Sayuri. You've done helicopter flight simulators and helicopters are not safe. Um, I don't know why we have tiny little clippings in here from an October 1938 issue of Aviation Magazine. But I don't know why they don't seem to have anything to do with the autogyro. So I don't know why they're in this folder. Um, going to set them aside for the moment. <clears throat> and actually, let's, let's just focus on one, one page at a time. Thanks a lot, Mel. The It's possible, DJ Phoenix. Yeah. I mean, it happens. I just... Um, I'll have to look at it and see if I can identify whether it is, belongs in a different folder or whether it's just a mystery. Um, bikes are to pogo sticks what planes are to helicopters? Wow. Okay. Pogo sticks are dangerous. Um, let's see. Thanks a lot, Mel. The dope that you and Walter I think it says dope dial I that you and Walter something. This there's a lot of loops and I'm not making it out very easily. If if anybody is making it out easily, please tell me. Uh, have given me on the hmm. have given me on the Cello Stork or Star? I, I'm, I'm assuming that's referring to a plane or something. F-I-E-S-E-L-E-O is what it looks like. Ah! It's the uh, Fieseler Storch, uh, Fieseler F-I-156 Storch, which is a plane. I think it's, thanks a lot, Mel, the dope that you and Walter Diebel have given me on the Fieselo Storch has changed my ideas regarding it considerably. Fred? This has nothing to do with an autogyro.
I do think that this possibly goes with, yes. So these items are actually about the Fiesler Storch monoplane, which is what the clippings here are about. These are related to this note, um, which tells me dope was once used as slang for information, as in give me the straight dope. Yes, DJ Phoenix. So I, I do believe that that word is dope. Um, is there a folder on the storage? Yeah, there's not. So whoever was processing this, um, when we're doing processing, this was probably in the same folder as the stuff about the Kellett um, from whoever provided these to us. Um, and we don't, as we're processing it, we don't go through and look at every single piece of paper. So whoever processed it would have had no, they wouldn't have known that this was not about the auto gyro. Um, because they wouldn't have been an expert on, on planes and aircraft and whatnot. Um, but yeah, this does not belong in the auto gyro folder. It belongs in a folder about the Fiesolo storage, uh, which there doesn't seem to be one. Um, so I may need to add a folder. Or the Fieseler. FI-156 storage. F-I-E-S-S-E-L-E-R. Yeah. Yep, there is there is currently no folder, um, but this doesn't belong with the auto gyro and belongs with the it it should have its own folder. Um or more likely what I end up doing is just renaming this folder so that it mentions that that information is in here as well. Because I don't know why it was in there to begin with. To me, it doesn't make sense, but whoever originally filed it there, filed it there. And uh, we try to preserve original order. Um, I might go back and look and see if there are any notes about the processing. Um, and if there are, it might just go in as a folder in front of this. Either that or I'll just add to the title of this folder that it also has that information. Oh, Cole Drake, thank you for the follow. Hannah, uh, thanks for coming by. I hope that the weather is, I hope that you stay safe as you travel home. Um, and, and yeah, I hope that it's just weather that gives you an afternoon off and um, that everything is good past there. But thanks for coming by. Uh, so let's, let's take a look. Actually, I just realized I should do it this way. Um, at the auto gyro stuff, because I was interested. So September 15th, 1938, I'm assuming. Uh, yeah, no. It's definitely, I was, I was saying, I'm assuming this is month day, but it can't be day month because there's no 15th month. Um, memo to, it looks like Aaron C, but it's 1938. It's much more likely that it is a memo to, like, Eric C. Uh, than to Aaron, spelled with an E. Although, uh, so Aaron spelled with a C, with an E, is typically a, a feminine name today. Um, but a lot of names that are typically feminine today used to be typically masculine. So Aaron 
with an E may have been much more common uh, male name in 38. I, I go into that analysis just because it's far more likely with aeronautics and aerospace in 1938 that this memo was probably written to a male identified person. Um, a fundamental difference between helicopters and gyroplanes is that in powered flight a gyroplane rotor system operates in auto rotation. In other words, the rotor spins freely as a result of air flowing up through the blades rather than using engine power to turn the blades and draw air down from above. Huh. So, if, so I'm confused then. What pushes the air up through the blades then? Uh, so, subject, flight of the Kellett YG-1B autogyro to bowling field and delivery to the Army. Uh, one, on August 14, 1938, I took off from Langley Field at 10.35 in the, in the Kellett YG-1B autogyro and landed at bowling field at 11.45. The rapid transit was... Um, occasioned by an unheard of tailwind. A log of notes made during the trip is attached. I returned that night on the Washington boat. Two, after landing without incident at bowling, I... Uh... Ah! I taxied over to the uh, Fiesler Storch, around which was gathered a large group of celebrities in civilian clothes, many of whom I recognized as Air Corps officers from Wright Field and the Chief's office. I was met by Mr. Helms, Colonel Davidson, and Lieutenant Smith, the later of whom was to demonstrate the gyro in comparison with the storch. So it makes sense why the two things are both in the folder. And yes, I just need to rename the folder to, to note that it also includes stuff on the storch. Uh, three, the tests as planned were in no way fair to the auto gyro. <laughs> nor was the pilot prepared to demonstrate it. The demonstration was terrible. The gyro never got off the ground. The pilot flooded the engine and had difficulty starting it. When trying to take off, he did not release the rotor critical, or he did not re release the ro rotor clutch and naturally the shear pin failed. There were no auto gyro people present and no army trained gyro mechanics. It seems to me that the clutch and gear drive were also damaged. I am at a loss to explain how a complete washout was averted because the takeoff attempt was con uh, was continued when the rotor was slowing down and the blades covering upward. Uh, yeah, and the blades covering upwards. Uh, lack of field downwind saved the day. That's why auto gyros typically had a forward engine pulling it forward. The rotating blades became a free spinning wing of a sort. Interesting, with the added lift due to blade geometry. Interesting, I had no idea. Um, lack of field saved the day. Uh, the spirit of the crowd 
was one of further disinterest. Quote, uh, exactly what we expected. Quote, far from perfection. Quote, can't be defend, depended upon when needed. Quote, just not practical. Uh, wow. The big already Uh, the, wait. Uh, it, it looks like already. No. I'm not sure what this word is. A biased crowd for a demonstration, yeah. Ah, I got it. The big, aerodynamically dirty, obviously lightly loaded, uh, five to six pounds per uh, aeronautical foot. I don't know, a, per, it looks like lowercase a foot, um, but I don't know for sure what that means. Uh, apparently highly powered storch put on a good show of the sloppy flying, uh, which can be done by a good pilot in an airplane equipped with slot, slots and, or slats and flaps. Um, good control and stability and a long travel land uh, and a yeah long travel landing gear uh this much to the de, much to the delight of everyone then everyone departed content while all the thumbs in the air corps continued their efforts to replace a shear pin wow this is a that was, a, a, this is a, a very, I can feel the passion in his uh, writing about this test. Uh, five, the storch failed to impress me. It was crude and dirty uh, with the considerations for, with, Uh, with due considerations for weight, size, power, and loadings, it had little not already seen on the McDowell uh, doodlebug. A strut, yeah, a strut braced high wing uh, monoplane with fixed leading edge slot over the entire wing and a wide cord slotted flap, a generous portion of the outer ends of which were ailerons. The ailerons had high mass balance arms and large Hetner balance tabs. I don't know what that means, uh, but Hetner appears to be a style of balance tabs, whatever those are. Uh, the rudder was large, as were the elevators. The latter had a large cord, full span, airfoil paddle uh, balance on the lower surface. The airplane apparently incorporated no unknown aerodynamic feature, and those it did have could surely be vastly improved in the light of present knowledge. Uh, in a steep climb, the elevators were drooped to an obviously large angle. Power was used to help check the vertical velocity in all steep glide landings. Naturally, the attitude could be varied through large angles, and the minimum spread was very low. Uh, the top speed was surely not over 120 miles per hour. 
basically he was ticked off. They basically set up a Kobayashi Maru for the autogyro test. Then they wound up trashing the autogyro. Yeah, like they set it up to fail and broke it. Um, this is really interesting. And after this debacle, I spent the remainder of the afternoon on the Naval Air Station. I discussed the control and stability of large airplanes with Commander Bulger and uh, I don't know, Mr. Round, uh, who made the flight tests on the XDB. It looks like XDBS one. Um, the SB2V1 with the stall warning device has been returned to the uh, vote factory. One test flight was made. I was permitted to read the report to the Bureau. Among other things, mostly favorable. It was said to be very instructive, uh, unnecessary. Uh, unnecessary if that airplane subject to mechanical failure um, bore out NACA claims, uh, doubtful under icing conditions and with a heavy drain on the battery, uh, the vote people were interested in investigating it thoroughly. I saw the new Northrop bomber with fully retracting gear, the Italian air attaches, uh, three-engined Cant, and Grumman's new twin-engined amphibian. The test section was flying with Jimmy Taylor and uh, Carl de Gamble, uh, the Hetterings stainless steel amphibian. Melvin and uh, G. Ooh. I feel like I did pretty good making out all of that handwriting uh, sight unseen. And the crowd pretty much already had their minds made up concerning the Storch, a German designed plane for short takeoff and landing. It could nearly land on super short runways, level ground. It was a very basic plane. Um, so. Amazing, amazing. Some notes about his flights in the autogyro. But then, after having read it, it makes sense why there's this note about the storch um, and the little like magazine articles about the storch because this folder is not just about the autogyro, but also about the storage. Uh, thanks a lot, Mel. Uh, the dope that you and Walter Diebel um, have given me on uh, the Fiesler storage has changed my ideas regarding it considerably. Um, signed Fred. I don't know who Fred is. Um, and then there's a couple clippings in here from 1938 about Storch, a monoplane featuring uh, slats and flat, uh, slots and flaps, which was flown at the national air races. And then um, Emil Kropf demonstrates the amazing Fiesler Storch. Um, it does reference uh, Nazis 1938. They appeared in a lot of magazines. Um, references to them. Uh, national air races are dealt with on other pages. One part of the program, however, was sufficiently unique to rate separate mention. Demonstration of the astounding Argus-powered Fiesler Storch safety plane recently developed in Germany. Emil Kropf, German stunt flyer, put the ship through an astounding range of stunts between a speed range of 20 and 120 miles per hour, um, out hovering a gyro. Un oh, so this is an article write-up of the test that this article is specifically about the test that um, Goff 
says was a setup. Out hovering a gyro, unbanked turns, short run takeoffs, dizzy climbs, this triumph of the slot and flap art should prove an infinite value in such work as polar exploration and geological survey. Average comment among American designers, boy, wouldn't it be swell to have the money to build something like that? Amazing. Most pilot, uh, by the 40s, yes. Okay, so uh, let me back up here. But because the storage was so simple, making it easy to construct, it beat out designs from manufacturers Messerschmitt and Siebel. And by the 40s, most countries used them. Most pilots loved the storage because it was a great, you can feel it in the seat of your pants type flying. Uh, amazing, thank you for sharing. Um, I also love that uh, we opened this up and it was like, why is this stuff in here about the storage? Maybe this, this is in the wrong spot. Maybe this should have been in a separate folder. Nope, nope, it belongs in here. It belongs in here and this folder should have a different title. Um, I don't know if I have any post-it notes with me today. Usually I do. So that when I run across things like that, I can make a note. I have a notepad. Um, because if I'm if I need to go back and um, actually like change something, I need to know that I need to go and change it. All the dirt in one folder. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> All right, box three, folder 15, uh, add to title. This is, this is because I'm the archivist. I can go in and make this change later. Uh, so you get to see my note here. Uh, FI-156. Cool. We've come across, before we've come across things that it was like, you know, this needs to be fixed. And then I went and fixed them. Um, particularly, we had one recently, which was uh, some like cooking flyers and whatnot. I don't remember exactly what it was. Um, but I ended up reprocessing it basically and sticking it in a bunch of different folders because it was clearly an exhibit that had divisions and yeah. It belongs in a museum. It is in a museum. Well, archive actually. Um, all right, let's see. What, what should we look at next? Um, we had box three. What time is it? All right, we've been live for about an hour, and I have five other boxes we haven't glanced at. So I'm gonna skip ahead and look to see what I might wanna pull out of box five. I think the spruce goose is in box five. Um, we have NACA reports, we've got... Uh, hydrodynamics and seaplanes. Aircraft stalling, inspection, boundary layer, daily log. The Flying Boat, the Hughes-Kaiser Flying Boat, 1947. Which is the Spruce Goose. So I'm going to pull out um, folder 29 from box five, but if you see something that you would like to look at, let me know. I do not know um, what we have in here specifically about this plane. <clears throat> it looks like there's a bit of material here. Uh, let me zoom out a little bit.
There we go. So many clicks. What I really need is two monitors there. Below the monitor monitor. No. Just, I just need more screens. More screens. That's what I need. Um, Let's see, first off, do we have an image or do I need to find one for you? Okay, so world's largest plane, the Hughes flying boat. <clears throat> So that is an image of the Hughes flying boat, um, colloquially known as the Spruce Goose. Um, and also known as the Hughes H4 Hercules, uh, but yes, the Spruce Goose six times larger than any aircraft of its time. So let's find out what we have in here specifically about this and <clears throat> what particularly interesting things we can learn. The, everything in the folder is supposed to be from 1947. Basically a balsa wood design. It, it, yes, I do believe it only flew once. I think you're correct on that. Um, it, was, it was the airplane version of the Titanic, essentially. Um, and then the Hindenburg was the blimp version of the Titanic. Like, let's make it so big that it fails. Uh, the wing, 11,430 feet squared for area. The wing span, 320.5 feet. Aspect ratio. Taper ratio, boot cord, root cord, tip cord, horizontal tail. Uh, you can see measurements there if you look. Um, it had eight Pratt and Whitney R4360s for engines. Design gross weight: 400,000 pounds. Weight when empty: approximately 266,000 pounds. It proved that too big to fail was a lie. Indeed, it was so big that it failed. Uh, it failed because it was big. Uh, maximum speed, normal rated power at sea level, 202 miles per hour. Uh, 60 per, uh, like cruising speed, 60% normal rated power at 5,000 feet, 152 miles per hour. Maximum rate of climb uh, from sea level, 530 FPN feet per minute, I assume. Service ceiling 12,400 feet, takeoff time 65 seconds. General, ratio of empty weight to gross weight is about 10% higher than for other current cargo airplanes. Distance, uh, possible cargo load pound. So 1,000 miles, 96,000 possible cargo load pounds. Uh, 3,000 miles, 36,500 pounds. Uh, three, in 1944, two different control systems had been proposed for airplane, A, power boost, and B, servo tabs. Don't know which was installed on the airplane. Hi, Abyssal Icarus. Welcome in. We are looking at materials from Melvin Goff, uh, who was a test pilot in the 
first half of the 20th century and then later um, worked on some early NASA stuff uh, just after the uh, Aeronautics Agency became the um, that became NASA and uh, then even still later uh, worked with the FAA on um, crash in uh, investigation. Um, <clears throat> right now I'm looking through a folder of stuff about the Spruce Goose. Um, there's a paper from 1954 from Newport News, Virginia. Howard Hughes's giant flying boat cost taxpayers millions. Oh, ads, yeah. Someday I should just grab a variety of collections of like old newspapers and we should look through just to look at the ads. Um, I enjoy the old ads too. And, and we've, I've looked at ads before like, but it's mostly like booklets and flyers and, and prepared marketing. Uh, we did one on a Sweet and Low. I think it was Sweet and Low. But the the pink, whatever's in the pink ones. Gosh, if it wasn't sweet and low. Because um, I had a whole ad campaign from the 80s, and we looked at that uh, a while back. But, but yeah, I have like old playbills and old newspapers that have a lot of, um, a lot of old ads in them. And not like going back into like the 1800s and such. Howard Stark in the MCU was heavily influenced by Hughes. Yes. <laughs> Surin relieves rheumatic pain in minutes or pay nothing. Oh dear. Uh, yeah, I, I'll take a dozen. I did a whole series on, um, I did a whole month of episodes uh, in 20, uh, 2021 a whole month of episodes um, on uh, patent medicines and, and um, basically uh, on folk medicine and patent medicines and, and stuff like that. Um, it was rather interesting. Hughes' flying boat crushed by flood. Howard Hughes' giant flying boat suffered damage. Wait, I... I can't make out what the name of the paper is. This is from September of 1953, though. Uh, suffered damage estimated at more than five million when a large earth dike burst on nearby property, spilling thousands of tons of mud, silt, and water into the Hughes hangar and dry dock at Terminal Island, California. Uh, the flood lifted the flying boat out of its dry dock and crushed it against an adjacent structure and, and the hangar. Company spokesman says Hughes and his engineers believe it would require in excess of a year to repair the damage. Yeah, Howard Hughes is an actual person, and the, MC the MCU does, does know that, yes. Oh, um, Cole. Uh, I did an episode on... Uh, the engineer that was designing a jetpack for NASA. Um, we didn't have a whole lot. If I well, no, we had testing of the jetpack itself. Uh, we had at least one or two photos, and then we had um, uh, some reports of the tests of of the jetpack. And I know we looked at that stuff on stream. Um, it may not be the Rocketeer jetpack, but. I've done Jetpack on stream, because uh, I found a collection here of stuff from a guy that was developing a Jetpack for NASA. There was no way I was not going to stream that. Um, so right now, so far, I'm seeing like a lot of like printed materials, articles. What I want is to see if. Uh, if this guy ever test flew one of these. Hughes' plane is a uh, 440,000 pound RFC problem. First time you saw a jetpack in use was from the original episode of Lost in Space. Um, DJ Phoenix, I don't, 
are, are, you, are you asking that of Cole about the one in Lost in Space? Because that, probably. Um, the jetpack that we talked about that was being developed for NASA, I doubt it because it never became a thing. Um, yeah, I don't believe that the one developed for NASA, uh, I think it was too bulky, not futuristic looking, etc., would not have been used. But I don't know, I've never seen the James Bond movies, so... Um, but yeah, it was not a viable jetpack in any way. <laughs> um, if you go there, I do have copies of those old videos on um, on the, the library's YouTube channel, and there's a playlist on my YouTube channel uh, that points to the videos on the library's YouTube channel. Um, let me see, what was that one? When was that one? Uh... Oh, I was right, it was Sweet and Low. Um, not Robeson. Gosh, was that all the way back in 2021? I think it might have been. I can't remember. Well, I will find out quite quickly. I just need to do a quick search for Jetpack. Because I don't remember the name of the person at the moment. Um, maybe two words. Come on. See, now, it, now it's going to be difficult. Why is it going to be? Otis Jerome Parker. It was the Otis Jerome Parker papers. Um, and those were, it was episode 52, uh, February 9th of 2022 when we looked at that. Um, I found it. Um, but yeah, they, it, it definitely was not a viable, um, it was jet shoes, not, not a jet pack, it was jet shoes, sorry. <laughs> uh, the bell rocket belt, yeah, that was, yeah. Bell aircraft jet pack highlighted in the James Bond movie Thunderball. So yeah, that's that's not what we had. It was jet shoes that um, were being developed for NASA. And and I have, um, if you go to the YouTube episode 52, Otis Drum Parker Papers, um, we spend a lot of time looking at like the testing of the jet shoes and um, figuring out what we can from uh, the materials there as to why they weren't viable. Um, Okay, so here's an article from 1947 from the Chicago Journal of Commerce um, about the Hughes Spruce Goose. Uh, zoom in a little here. Uh, July 8th, Howard Hughes's flying boat weighing 44, uh, four, 440,000 pounds is the air industry's first motion toward a flying freight train despite all that has been said about flying boxcars and is a number one problem for the Reconstruction Finance Corporation, its guardian and keeper. The agency likes to talk about the monster even though it does not know quite what to do with this plastic wood plane uh, built by Mr. Hughes and Associates and RFC during the war at a cost of $18 million. Uh, the boat presently rests in a harbor off Culver City, California, where the giant was conceived. It is awaiting unnamed gadgets and the go-ahead for testing. 
plane hasn't flown. <clears throat> because the plane has not as yet flown, and because the military are uncertain as to its value, RFC sees no possibility of the boat being declared surplus in the immediate future. RFC is almost afraid that the boat will run over somebody or something before it gets into the air. As if he were discussing the combining of uranium-235 with this and that, one source today explained, rather nervously, that he thought private industry shouldn't fool with this thing. Uh, not that he didn't think private industry could fly the boat. He thought the military could take over because according to all drawing board specific should take over because according to all drawing board specifications, the Hughes plane will fly and perhaps be of tremendous value to the military. RFC wants the government's air, coordinate, uh, air coordinating committee to test the boat, uh, but this offer apparently has been declined. Uh, tuning of the eight motors, which generate a total of 24,000 horsepower, has been authorized, but RFC does not know when a test flight would be ordered. The wing spread is 320 feet, and the hull is 220 feet long, 30 feet high, and 25 feet wide. Each of eight propellers has four blades measuring 17 feet long. Its 14 fuel tanks carry 1,000 gallons of gasoline each. Top speed at, speed le at sea level is estimated at 218 miles an hour. With 175 miles cruising speed, construction was first authorized in 1942 by Defense Plant Corporation, an RFC subsidiary. It is said that Henry J. Kaiser left the project in 1944 when he saw the impossibility of making the plane in mass quantities. <laughs> the shade, yes, Abyssal. You wonder if the jet shoes were a high concept looking into space EVAs. I believe they were, Cole Drake. It's been, like I said, it's been almost a year uh, since we looked at that. So I honestly don't remember for sure. Um, but yeah, I do believe they were kind of a high concept thing. Um, Let's see, <laughs> Senate probing Senator Owen Brewster, upset about the fact that the spruce goose wasn't finished being made, and apparently taxpayer dollars had been used. Um, not going to dig into tons of this. Oh, the spruce goose? Yeah, it's, it's ginormous. Um, This is, I have a, a better picture of it that I showed a little bit ago, but it was before you got here. So uh, there's, there's the spruce goose. I'm digging through to see if there's anything specifically from Goff. Uh, 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 from Goff. or if this is just notes on a plane. I have some handwritten notes, but not specifically about like him testing it or anything. Ooh. <clears throat> there are some interesting things in here, so I'm gonna You've only seen parodies. The only thing the military used from the Spruce Goose project was the Hercules name for the C-130 transport. I wouldn't be surprised, or I shouldn't be surprised. Let's see. Um, copy, Reconstruction Finance Corporation, Office of Defense Plants, uh, March 20th, 1947, to Mr. Melvin Goff, Chief, Flight Research Division, National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics, Langley Field, Virginia. Dear Mr. Goff, uh, enclosed herewith are copies of comments furnished by the War and Navy Departments and Civil Aeronautics Administration relative to the proposed flight test program for the HK-1 Hughes cargo plane. As I advised you today, the first meeting of the various government representatives for the purpose of evaluating the proposed flight test program will be held at this office, room 953, on Monday, March 24th, 1947, at 10 a.m. I understand that you or Mr. Parkinson, or both, will be in attendance on behalf of National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics. 
Very truly yours, T.F. Wilson Council. 747 is 13 feet longer than the Spruce Goose, but no plane so far has beat the wingspan. Um, I want to see here. Oh, it doesn't say. I'm trying to see if there's a actual description of the proposed test, testing plan. Um, you've had a walk around the C-130 and been inside. They can make you feel really small, even just standing next to the tires. I've only been close to like jet planes, not like big cargo planes. Oh, yep, here we go. This is, this is kind of the type of thing that I was looking to see if was in here, and, and it is, because this is an amazing collection that I still have not hardly scratched the surface of. Uh, copy, Naval Air Test Center, U.S. Naval Air Station, Patuxent River, Maryland. Uh, 5 March 1947, to Rear Admiral C.A. Nicholson, U.S. Navy, subject H-4 te flight test program for the Hughes HK-1 flying boat. Comments on uh, enclosed uh, letter to Chief Bauer. Yeah, I think that's supposed to be Bauer. Uh, dated 26 February 1947, and preliminary proposed H4 test flight test program. Uh, one, in compliance with your verbal request, the subject flight test program has been reviewed, and the following comments are submitted. Two, instrumentation appears to be generally adequate. However, it is suggested that the following instruments be added. A, at pilot station. One, trim angle indicator. Two, elevator angle indicator. Three, sensitive accelerometer. And four, sensitive airspeed meter. B, on the photo panel. One, adequately damped accelerometer. Two, carburetor uh, deck pressure and air temperature gauges. Uh, three, general program of tests seems adequate with a few exceptions which will be listed below. It is not understood in what order the tests will be run. If they are to be done in the order A, B, C, etc. as listed, it is suggested that the order be changed as given below. Specific recommendations are A, the asymmetric power tests under phase B should be deferred until completion at the, of at least one half of the static and dynamic stability tests of phase D and the hydrodynamic tests of phase G are completed. It's hoped that the stall program will be handled with care. The dangers of stalling a large airplane of this type, particularly if an aileron snatch occurs, cannot be overemphasized. Initial stalls should be made at as light weights as possible. See in, day, in phase D, an addition of tests for adverse yaw due to aileron deflection and of steady side slips to test for control fixed and free directional and lateral stability would be desirable. D, early information on the hydrodynamic characteristics of the airplane would be desirable, though it is suggested that phase G be done after phase A, uh, at least one half of the static and dynamic stability investigation phase D should be done next. Stall investigation phase C can be done concurrently with phase D, and tests of phase B and performance tests phase E uh, can be done concurrently and should be done next to last. The range check phase F should be done last, but prior to the research phase if done. Four, all of the foregoing is based on the assumption that phase A, the preliminary tests, will be adequate enough to demonstrate pr proper engine operation and cooling, structural integrity, and freedom from any unsafe or highly undesirable flight characteristics. Five, all papers returned here with as enclosure A. Um, the one thing that I take away from like everything that I have seen of this collection is that the media portrayal of test pilots as cocky, um, daring, carefree risk takers is far from accurate. They may love the thrill, they may enjoy the risk, they may get a kick out of the danger. 
This guy is super knowledgeable. He can often tell them how to make the plane design better just from flying it. And he can tell it to them in the technical terms that the plane designers use. He's exceptionally knowledgeable about the mathematics and the like technical aspects of aeronautical design. And the reports that he writes after test piloting an aircraft give detailed information based on the instruments that were used during the flight, his personal impressions and analysis, and, and yeah, like he's amazing. Test pilots were vocal instrument recorders. Yeah, like uh, very, very different than the media portrayal of irresponsible, uh, it basically like irresponsible stunt risk taker people. Just read the bio of Chuck Yeager. So this one, yeah, I don't know. I'm not gonna dig through this. I think we've, I think we've spent enough time with the Spruce Goose. I wanna look and see what else we've got. Oh, I'm glad to see that you made it home safe and sound, Hannah. Welcome back. Um, A bit wild, but he could fly anything. Yeah, I just that that I I was surprised by just how expert um, Goff comes off as. I I and just how technical the reports that he prepared were, like. I shouldn't have been surprised. He was a professional and an expert in his field. But the media portrayal of test pilots is, is far from the reality. Uh, let's see, I am now looking at box nine, but definitely if you're looking at the fine aid, glance ahead at uh, 10, 16, and 22 as well. Let me know if anything pops for you. Um, because we are down to about a half an hour. So I wanna make sure if there's something that you see that would be interesting to look at, uh, that I get it on stream for you. Jet engines, shoulder harness. Um. I think I pulled box nine specifically for some, uh, so that we could look at some of the um, crash investigation type things. So I might pull one of those. <clears throat> B45 crashes, folder 26. We'll see. Uh, A little harder to get to this folder, the way that my setup is. Give me one second here. Mm. Yes. Mm. Crashes. Um, let me see what box 10 might have in store for us as well. Ice, spinning, aircraft accident, survival, daily log, 50th, 50th anniversary of flight. Oh, box 10, flying saucers. Box 10, folder 16, flying saucers. I'm very curious about that one. Um, I do not think he test piloted flying saucers, but uh,
I will not know unless I look at the folder. <laughs> Baseball. Hey, there is a, there is a, uh, a folder labeled Flying Saucers. I must pull it. Uh, I'll also pull the de Havilland Comet. NASA did have some wonky flying shapes and hovering monsters. <laughs> um, and then let me see if I saw any highlights in box 16. Somehow my headphones cord has gotten way down under me and it was very uncomfortable. Oh, okay, I've adjusted that now. Um, box 16. Takeoff monitor, NASA organization. Recommendations regarding a national civil space program. NASA committee, NASA special committee on space technology. That could be interesting. Um, the Mercury project. The pilot's role in spaceflight. <laughs> SLV. The Thor missile, circa 1959. Actually, that I think that might be interesting. I don't know anything about that. Um, <clears throat> folder 38. And again. Tell me if one of these stands out to you. I'm going to try and get through all of these as fast as I can. But and some of them are really thin folders. So I might actually succeed in getting through everything that I set aside here. The last box is folder 22. Or box 22. I'm going to look and see what stood out to me and why I pulled that one for today. And I can always continue pulling this collection if, if we would be interested in more stuff. Um, Apollo Accident, DC-7, DC-133, Manned Space Flight Safety Program. Concord Flight Test, 1971. Box, let's see, that's folder 31. The Concord. All right, I definitely have a few things here. The pilots roll in space flight back when they still felt they could replace a pilot with a trained monkey. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to start with, uh, this folder is titled B-45 Crashes. I don't know what the B-45 is. I know that it is not a band that sings about Rock Lobster. Um, that's the B-52s. Uh, <clears throat> okay, we have a, a handbook, Flight Operating Instructions, for U.S. Air Force Model B-45A1, uh, A5, and B-45C airplanes, and we have a drawing of a B-45. So, at least we have an image. Images help me. Um, The North American B-45 Tornado was an early American jet bomber designed and manufactured by aircraft com company North American Aviation. Thank you, Cole Drake. Um, <clears throat> GR uh, Gherkins, Aerodynamics, Airplane Analytics, Elevator Boost Output. This is pilot's flight operating instructions for model B-45A aircraft. And C, um, December 14, 1948. 
The purpose of this letter is to put forth data sub uh, substantiating arguments against the present boost adjustments uh, procedure for the production B-45A airplanes and to recommend a procedure that will allow a consistent boost output. Although indicated are the settings required for, or if satisfactory wheel forces with respect to the specified USAF stability requirements are to be realized for accelerated stability and during landing at the forward CG positions. Um, I don't know. That's not about the crashes. I'm, this folder is labeled crashes, so that's, that's where my focus is right now, and I want to see... Let's see what this is. Oh, I love... <laughs> this is inner office distribution. Uh, from Naka Langley, 1954. Um, they were sending around this newspaper article. I don't have, apparently I need to bring a, um, um, a microplane spatula with me so I can take out rusty staples without doing it by hand. Thankfully, I have nails today. Because um, I don't want to tear the paper getting the staple out. And I usually use a micro spatula for that. Um, uh, two rest dazed, two rest dazed pilot at controls, plane lands safely. W-R-E-S-T, rest. That I don't understand. I need to read the article because I don't understand what they're saying. Military wanted to up the speed, but it made the plane much less stable. Interesting. A youthful Air Force flyer and a civilian yesterday engaged in a dramatic struggle in the air to wrest control of a jet bomber from the dazed and badly injured pilot. Ah, okay. The plane finally was landed safely. The four-jet B-45 Tornado Bomber had taken off from Norton Air Force Base on a test flight. At 15,000 feet, the cockpit canopy blew off, striking the pilot on the head. The base spokesman said this, said this followed. The canopy cut a deep gash and left the pilot, Captain Gerald E. Mann, 33, stunned and irrational. The co-pilot, 2nd Lieutenant Donald J. Rowley, 22, a recent Air Force Flying School graduate, making his third flight in this type of plane, tried to take over the bomber with his controls. The pilot, with blood blinding him, fought to retain control. The bomber flew in great wavering circles as the two struggled for control. Arden L. Hellwing, uh, aircraft overhaul inspector also aboard, worked his way along a catwalk to the pilot's cockpit. He finally managed to tear Captain Mann from the controls and hold him. Rowley, a boyish, boyish lieutenant who had never landed such a heavy plane, set it down on the base field. Uh, Mann, chief of the Norton Air Force Base Flight Test Inspection Division, is reported in critical condition. Interesting. Um, so let's see what this says. Yeah, dear Mel, in reply to your question regarding a means of forcibly removing the canopy, our aircraft have not been modified to incorporate a method to perform this function. Our uh, B-45s have been modified to include compliance with TO uh, 0160 GFA 133 dated 10 May 1951. However, during an informal conversation between Colonel Price and Mr. Earl Moore in October 1953 at Norton Air Force Base, California, it was learned that the NAA were submitting a proposal to add two pneumatic cylinders to the front part of the canopy to force it off in case bailout is required. Mr. Moore is the NAA project engineer in charge of modifications being made at Norton. Details of this change are not known, nor is it known whether this change has been 
uh, accepted by the Air Force. We appreciate your interest in the problems experienced with the B-45 and regret that more information is not available. Uh, thanks for the letter and give my best to uh, General C.D. <laughs> Signed, David Jones, uh, Colonel, U.S. Air Force Commander. Um, and that was in response to a letter from Melvin uh, Goff. Um, boop, boop, ba -doop. Looking into a pilot detection system, it wasn't installed in the plane that lost the canopy. Um, yeah. Or they're unaware of it being installed, for sure. Uh, Dear Davy, you, Davy Jones, yeah. Uh, you may recall that in August of 1951, we lost our most experienced test pilot in a B-45 airplane, apparently because he was unable to get rid of the canopy. The resulting accident investigation also cast suspicion on the elevator control boost system and the possibility of inadvertent trim tab operation. I am now quite curious to know if anything has been done to incorporate in operational B-45s an improved means for the positive ejection of a canopy. Uh, I would appreciate knowing how it has been accomplished and how satisfactory it is. Uh, Can C.D. Jones, or, or General C.D. Jones, extends his regards and suggested that I contact you directly. So, apparently the B-45 had some problems. Um... But looking at the time, I'm not going to investigate the B-45 further because I want to glance at some of these other folders too. Um, but I'm curious and interested, and there's a lot more stuff in here that might go into unsatisfactory report. Oh my gosh. Uh, yeah, I have a feeling we could spend an hour or more digging into why the people why the B-45 had problems. I bet their test had the canopy popping back and slamming into the vertical tail. Possibly, but clearly uh, it, it sounded like at least once um, the canopy popped off and struck the pilot in the head, uh, which shouldn't happen. Um, flying sauce. It looks like one news article in here about flying saucers. I'm very curious. Flying saucer pilot. Scientist reports talk with visitor from Venus. <laughs> I, there's no way I read this entire thing, but um, I, I will at least read the introduction to it uh, because everything has been like super technical and then there's this article about flying saucers. Venus, the spa planet. Uh, George Adamski of Mount Palomar, California says that flying saucers exist. When is this from? October 23rd, 1953. Um, that they come from tremendous interplanetary carrier ships that these mother ships from Venus uh, that he has photographed both the mother ships uh, the mother ship and the saucers uh, and most startling of all that he has actually talked with a man from Venus whose external appearance is just like an earthman's Adamski has pictures and the sworn and notarized statements of six witnesses to substantiate his claim. The amazing story, which is either the greatest news event or the greatest hoax in history, is told in the just published Flying Saucers Have, Have Landed, British Book Center, New York. Oh gosh, they're selling a book. It's a famous UFO image. I don't know that I'd ever seen that one before, but that is one of his photos. Uh, the Amazing Story, oh, let's see, sorry, they're selling a book for $3.50, which Adamski has written 
uh, together with Desmond Leslie, an English writer who has contributed a section on flying saucer reports throughout human history, Adamski describes himself as a philosopher, student, teacher, saucer researcher. Uh, he lives near the famous Hale Observatory and uh, uh, at Mount Palomar, but is not associated with it, and his observations and photographs uh, have been made with his own equipment. He owns two Newtonian reflector telescopes. One is a 15-inch instrument housed under a dome. The other is a portable 6-inch device. Adamski says he has always believed uh, academically in the possibility of uh, of life on other planets. However, the idea of interplanetary travel seemed remote to him until on October, 4, or October 9th, 1946, I actually saw with my naked eyes a gigantic spacecraft hovering high above the mountain ridge to the south of Mount Palomar towards San Diego. He presumed that this was a new kind of aircraft until radio broadcasts in San Diego and the testimony of other observers disclosed that the object was a mystery. He determined to investigate for himself. Um, Puddleglum, I don't know. I just keep finding more. There seems to be a lot of stuff in our archives about UFOs. Um, I'm curious. I'm just skimming to see if Goff, as a test pilot, had potentially been asked to make a quote or something, but I don't see anything. Um, I guess this was just a curiosity to him, and so it was in Among His Papers. He must have seen the ship that gave Ralph Hinckley his super suit. It's an interesting article, uh, but I'm not reading the whole thing, because, like I said, I'm going through these fast. De Havilland Comet. Um, I'm excited. Uh, uh, you know, I could probably do, and ha I have done, entire episodes on UFOs, uh, but I could, I could do a much more focused episode on, like, actual UFOs if I took the time to actually poke into the collections and find images or articles that are specifically about UFOs or cryptids. I tried to do cryptids, and then we didn't find a whole lot on cryptids. We found a whole lot of misogyny instead. Um, de, the de Havilland Comet, <clears throat> let's see, what can we learn about the comet in a couple of minutes? Uh, Mel, <clears throat> this is 1956. Um, although the cone, in part, does not seem to be uh, stable too clearly, um, they have a real point, a similar problem A similar problem, uh, I don't know what that word is, on the NGL DC-6 at M Mobile Bay. Um, on this, Huh. Uh, I, I'm having a lot of trouble with this handwriting. Uh, pilot could... I, I'm uncertain. But there... I don't, I don't know. I don't know. It's all about first, first bomber, comets, the first commercial aircraft, spruce, 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 the first balsa wood plane, uh, let's see, the aeroplane, 
Bowling Green Lane. Dear sir, your review of The Comet Riddle, uh, 5th August 1955, in which you refer at some length to the Rome accident, prompts me to give a reappraisal of this accident, which has recently been made by members of our airworthiness study group. To do justice to, to the case, it is necessary to go into considerable detail, but I trust that, in view of the concern, uh, still felt among pilots and the possibility of prejudice of future relationships with the industry, you will allow me to comment at some length. So I, there's a handwritten note attached to this, and it would take me a while to try and parse out the note. I, I was, you could see the handwriting, and it was very, I can make out some words, but others, like I don't get enough verbs <laughs> uh, to, to figure out what is being said, but uh, the so-called tail-down attitude of the takeoff. The most common misapprehension is the assumption that the tail was down during the relevant portion of the ground run. Now we have examined a certain amount of the evidence on this point and find there is little or nothing to support it. At Rome, the tail bumper uh, scores on the runway appear at a distance no less than 400 yards after the theoretical um, and about 200 yards after the agreed point at which unstick was made. It will be shown that the accident occurred at and beyond the unstick point due to the pilot being quoted an unstick speed which caused the wing to become stalled or partially stalled. In this condition, of course, the aircraft would probably sink back to, on to the runway tail first, hence the bumper scores. But it is our view that the accident was occasioned 400 to 200 yards before the score marks and thus the marks cannot be any evidence as to the cause. Other evidence of an early tail down attitude appears to come from an American airline employee who is reported to have said that the attitude looked pretty critical, uh, but who did not enlarge on this in any way. Uh, as this is a fair description of any comet takeoff during the first few moments of operations, uh, when the old lift the nose at 80 knots technique was in force, and as the accident occurred on a dark night of drizzle with the observer some distance from the runway, presumably judging a few degrees of angle of attack from the navigation light attitudes, uh, there would appear here to be little enough from which to found a whole theory for the accident upon the takeoff attitude. They thought they pulled up too fast and dragged the tail and crumpled the airframe. The Comet had a run of failures. They had four jet engines that were snugged up uh, to the root of the wing next to the fuselage. Lots of structural fatigue failures. Interesting. Um, oh gosh, this report is not well. Yeah, I begin to, I, I really wish I had brought my micro spatula so that I could take the staples out. Um, especially when there is a simpler and more positive explanation elsewhere. Another witness who might be expected to have noticed any abnormal tail down attitude is the first officer, who, however, is not reported as noting anything unusual during the ground run of the aircraft. He says that the stick was a fair way back, but this too may relate to, period, to the period after the unstick was made and so be irrelevant to the accident if it was occasioned at the unstick point. Hence, we remain entirely unconvinced that there is any positive evidence of pilot error during the takeoff run and before the speed recommendation for unstick. On the other hand, there is much evidence of a positive nature to show that the error may be found elsewhere, and this is demonstrated in the following paragraphs. <laughs> and then they go into detail of why they think that uh, the error is not the pilot. It wasn't the pilot. Um, and, and here's all the reasons why. Um, so, not gonna dig into all the reasons why they think that it wasn't the pilot, uh, but... He found out why the comets blew up. Wow, look at that. The skeleton of a wrecked comet was assembled as fast as fragments were recovered from the sea. The diagnosed cause of the explosions, metal fatigue. One of my favorite, um, one of my favorite uh, disaster movies, and I, I quite like disaster movies, um, 
is about an airplane accident that was caused by metal fatigue. Uh, not a comet, however. Um, that one was a, uh, a Hawaiian Air flight. The movie is called Miracle Landing, um, and it's about an incident where ultimately they discovered that it was the sea air, the salt in the sea air, that uh, prematurely fatigued the fuselage and um, that they couldn't fly them as long. Uh, when they were hopping from island to island in the middle of the Pacific. Um, yeah. It's one of my favorite, um, like, disaster movies. So we get some images in here of the comet. I'm not going to read this entire article. It is much longer than I had anticipated. Yes. Yes, Cole Drake. It is a movie about uh, the flight, um, the Hawaiian Air flight, where the fuselage, the top of the fuselage ripped off. Uh, last I checked, um, the only place I was able to find it uh, was on YouTube and it was like free on YouTube. I think it was a made for TV movie, but I'm not sure. Um. <laughs> Interesting. So there's a lot of stuff in here about the to have one to comet, but we're two minutes over time and I still have two folders and I want to glance at them. Um, they're both relatively thin. Um, the first is the Thor XSM-75 missile, uh, which is definitely a NASA-related thing. And I don't even know if I'm gonna be able to read these. This is heat-sensitive paper. Um, and very, very faint. Uh, I will attempt to zoom in a little bit so that you might be able to see what is on this page. Um, this is classified. Um, Thor, range, 1,500 nautical miles, payload weight, uh, 1,600 pounds, length, 66 feet, thrust, 150 pounds, 150,000 pounds, I think. I think that's a comma. Uh, diameter, eight feet. Maximum altitude, 445 nautical miles. Takeoff weight, 110,000 pounds. Max Mach number, I think it says one. I think it's maximum Mach 1, but it's really, really hard to make out. Um, so, possibly no. Uh, circa 1959, Cold Drake. Uh, size, oh, sorry. Take off weight 110, oh. Cut off weight 13,740 pounds. Size, 86 feet in length. Two feet longer than the red stone. Eight feet diameter, about two feet long, larger than the red stone. 110,000 pounds. Um, hundred and ten thousand pounds takeoff weight uh, is about twice that of the redstone. Um, wow, this is really hard to make out what this says. I should probably, uh, while I have this, I should probably transcribe this page um, just in case it fades further. Uh, it could only go the speed of sound max. I think so. Um, oh, 
Oh no, it is it is not Mach 1. Here this this says speed is Mach 15. Three times that of the redstone. So it's just that it's so faded up there that I but this is it says Mach 15. Uh, range is 1,500 nautical miles. Uh, maximum altitude maintained is 440 nautical miles. Uh, main engine burnout is something. Uh, seconds plus six seconds. Uh, ver uh, vernier operations for 1,500 nautical miles. Uh, design CEP is two nautical miles. This is very hard to make out. Yeah, Mach 15 is what it says. Um, wow. A single stage ballistic missile powered by a 150,000 pound thrust engine. Oh boy, it's super faded over here on this side. Um, I think there's been some exposure to uh, additional heat, which has darkened this part of the paper over here, um, but I'm not certain. Uh, uses RP-1, a low-grade kerosene-type fuel similar to jet fuel, and LOX is the oxidizer. This engine was developed by North American for use in the Navajo missile. This same engine is used to power the Thor, Jupiter, and Atlas missiles. The engine is um, <clears throat> Mounted on gimbals for directional control. Final fine adjustment of velocity and direction is made by two 1,000 pound vernier engines mounted on uh, either side of the main booster. The airframe manufacturer is Douglas. The inertial guidance system is built by AC Spark Plug Company. Uh, so this is the type, the, the Thor. Let's see, the US was worried about the Russians having intercontinental mi missile capabilities, Thor, a crash December 1955 program to produce an Air Force intermediate range ballistic missile with the same range as the Army's Jupiter. The Thor was a liquid propellant intermediate range ballistic missile developed by Douglas in 1956 to 1958. Thank you for that additional information because I was unfamiliar with the Thor, um, but we have operational program estimate. Uh, this is marked secret at the bottom. Um, not top secret, and it's archived and public information now, but um, so yeah, we've got those reports. but. Uh, the summary on this first page is actually really interesting, just incredibly difficult to read. I'm gonna, um, I'm just gonna make a note for myself that I don't want to send this back to storage until I've transcribed it and printed out a, a, a um, copy of the transcription to put in the folder as well, uh, just in case it fades more or in case somebody doesn't have eyes that are able to make out the words. Um, if I transcribe it, since I've already struggled to make out some of what it says, um, somebody in the future won't have to. Uh, finally, uh, a quick glance at the Concorde test flight, Pan American World Airways, August 16th, 1971. Uh, to Melvin Goff, dear Mel, thank you for the slides of the San Antonio S7 meeting. They bring back pleasant memories old, of old friends. The newspaper articles were a bit rough, and all out of proportion to what actually happened. Since you have shown interest in this incident, find enclosed an internal note explaining the newspaper article to Borger and a verse written by some knowledgeable wag. It turns out that the cockpit instrumentation for indicating G 
uh, was inaccurate and we had no way of knowing how far we had gone until the next day when the recordings were read. However, nothing really happened except a standard flight test evaluation of handling qualities and a good ringing out of the aircraft. Thanks for your interest and best personal regards. Sincerely, Scott Flower. Um, late 50s through the 60s, the U.S. developed a bushel of short, medium, and long-range missile delivery systems. Of course, the space program was sort of proof that the U.S. could carry packages into high Earth orbit and back. Almost another Cold War delivery system. Yeah. Um, <laughs> July 30th, 1971. Subject, controversial Concorde test flight. The article published in the Sunday Times London, dated 725-71, um, is so biased and full of untruths that for the record, I felt I should sort out the fact from the fiction. Newspaper fiction. The pilot who bent Britain's Concorde during a test flight last week was 61-year-old Captain Scott Flower, brought out of retirement by Pan American to head their flight research into the supersonic airliner. Truth. The aircraft was not bent or damaged in any way. Captain Fowler is not 61 years old, he is 62 years old, and was not brought out of retirement, but has worked continuously for the company since 1936 and is director of flight research at this time. Newspaper fiction. He was the oldest man by 12 years to fly a Concorde, six years over the age limit for airlines like BOAC, and he did not even fly himself all the way to the Concorde test because he is a year over the American limit for commercial piloting. Truth, uh, he should have been 13 years and seven, er, he sh uh, should have been 13 years and seven years over the age limit for airlines like the OAC. He would not have flown himself there anyway if not limited by US requirements for it would have disrupted the schedule for two days, for the two days required. Uh, fiction. Yesterday, after his unusual handling of the aircraft had brought a series of evaluation flight uh, to an abrupt end, Captain Flower was back in the United States at a hideaway address in Florida, writing his report on Concorde. Uh, truth, the handling of the aircraft was not unusual, but a standard test maneuver used in aircraft handling evaluations. The preliminary report was written on the routine flight to the U.S. July 21st, typed on the 22nd, and a copy mailed to uh, Brian uh, Trubshaw the same day before the newspaper article was ever written. Uh, and then fiction, let's see, in Britain, MPs and the employees of the British Aircraft Corporation uh, who build the Concorde were expressing concern that a man of the captain's age should be allowed to fly an aircraft, which has already cost the British and French governments more than 500 million. Uh, uh, and then the truth, the difference in philosophy between British and American design is expressed here since in the U.S. we build airplanes that old men can handle easily, which enhances safety even for the younger, more vigorous pilots. Um, I love this. It, this is fact-checking, circa 1971. Uh, and it continues. Of course, all of this fact-checking is by the person that they are lambasting in the newspaper article. Uh, one Scott Flower. <laughs> Concord, bent by an American, age 61. The article published in the London Times has titillated men with thinking minds, so they must respond to a man named Daw, who can't tell a roll from a pitch or a yaw. Proto Snopes. Um, he accused Flower of being old and spent, and as a result, the Concorde was bent. But this airplane genius was never so wrong because Concorde turned out to be sound and strong. The maneuver in question was a wind-up turn, the object of which was to try and discern the dynamics of elevons for commercial aircraft, which now have been proven in spite of the chaff. He stated the handling has caused concern among BAC employees who, in turn, feel this captain of ancient age should not jeopardize Concorde at this early stage. Maybe airplanes made to British designs differ from those built along U.S. lines. We produce our machines for old pilots to fly so they will be safer for young ones to try. A takeoff described as hairiest I've seen by a young engineer no doubt in his teens who has not observed abused takeoff demonstrations where he has been during 
where has he been during aircraft certification? The incredibly tight turn the old man did make, as reported by Dawes, uh, that misinformed rake was a standard maneuver in flight test fused to determine the G per pull force used. The maneuver in detail will now be described, so the truth may be spread both far and wide to silence the thunder of a British reporter who garbled his facts for more than he orda. Uh, for more than he orda. Uh, the continuous bank was flown with great care until 60 degrees were shown to be there, with a control column pull of some 60 pounds force, while an engineer called 2.3G a little bit hoarse. Response in poetic rhyme. Uh, the nose dropped a bit, and to make it stop, the wheel was honked in, and right on the spot, a recovery was made and the bank angle depressed, as a slight push over accomplished the rest. Uh, as a slight push over accomplished the rest. The pull force exerted can be the only explanation of the G-spike recorded with such short duration. So short, in fact, that it could not be noted, and no excess G's during flight were quoted. Now the clincher from this newspaper runt, the manufacturer caused weightless, the, the maneuver caused weightlessness, a devious stunt to mask the effect from the bold English crew, um, and it was only bad flower who really knew. Uh, the sound like the words of an unthinking fool who seems to have wasted his time while in school. For how in the hell can you pull 3G and still feel weightless? It just cannot be. This story lacks basis, as any can see, since you can't be weightless while pulling 3G. A cover-up for the crew, eliminating blame, but the gallant Trubshaw responded, for shame. The last implication that bastard did this bastard did drop was that PAA thinks the Concord is a flop. So Captain S. Flower, their senile old gent, was dispatched to Fairford, to the Concord to rent. In truth, PAA, perhaps more than the rest, has spared no effort to make Concord the best. This newspaper story, dredged up from a sewer, can only be thought of as British manure. It seems that the hazards of flying Concord depend a great deal on the people on board. The aircraft flies, in fact, like a charm. Big mouths, not pilots, cause all the alarm. So I say to all pilots, the bold and the meek, if ever you chance to fly in this streak, don't make any turn, stay level, no climbs, or you may end up in the London Times. <laughs> That was a fun, a fun find. <laughs> this guy clearly missed their past life as a bard. The snark is strong. And this, I bet he did not like Green Eggs Mayhem after the flight. <laughs> yeah, sometimes you take whatever creative outlet you can get. That was, that was fun. I'm, I'm happy that we ran across the poem. Um, and that I took the time to read it. But uh, it is for... 49 here and I do need to be wrapping up and uh, um, heading out for the day. Stick close to your desks and never go to sea and you all may be rulers of the Queen's Navy. Yes, indeed, Puddle Glove, it sort of had that same sort of feel um, as Gilbert and Sullivan. It, it totally could have been a Gilbert and Sullivan song. Um, all right. Thank you all so much for joining me for um, the, the, another look at the Melvin Goff papers. I honestly think that there is so much more potential to, to look at these papers and I will probably pull them out again in another six or 12 months so that we can glance at some more aviation stuff because it's a huge collection. It's 22 boxes and there's, there's a ton of really interesting stuff in it. Um, the things you find in a box in the attic, it's, we are not the attic. We are definitely not the attic. We are in archives. But um, they may have been in somebody's attic at some point in time. Um, next week, I'm starting a series uh, that will go on probably at least six months. Um, but the series is um, the final Wednesday of every month. Uh, will be part of an ongoing series on high-energy physics. Um, 
So I have identified a number of collections that all deal with high energy physics. Um, and so we're going to be looking at them starting next week. Uh, the final Wednesday of every month will be high energy physics series. Um, and the first one uh, we're going to look at is um, Robert Marshak's papers, series one. <laughs> Uh, the next, actually, two months, uh, so January and February, both, will be Marshak, and then after that I've got some other, uh, other papers that we're going to look at. Um, but it should be an interesting time uh, looking at early nucle nuclear physics and other things like that, um, so it'll be, it'll be interesting. wonder if, you're, if you call your box pile an archive of your landlord less bothered by it. Uh, high, energy, high energy physics, so nuclear physics in particular, um, but it may include other high energy physics, not just of the nuclear variety, but it is definitely focused on uh, nuclear because that's what we happen to have. Um, I ran across all of this while I was, I'm working on a blog post that'll go up on our blog soon-ish um, about the Argonaut nuclear reactor that used to be here on campus. Uh, so I ran across more stuff about high energy physics and, and decided I'm just going to share what I can find. Um, let me see who we're going to say hello to. We've got, uh, I don't know where I'm going to raid because, okay, well, I think we're going to go over to the aquarium today. Um, I don't know what they're doing today. And uh, like, yeah, I don't, I don't know what the aquarium is doing today, but we are going to head over to the aquarium, uh, Monterey Bay Aquarium, a lovely chill channel. Hopefully, um, you enjoy hanging out there for a bit, uh, as you continue with your day. Um, I hope that I see you again here in the future, possibly next week. Maybe not, but you know. I hope I see you again uh, on Archival Adventures. Um, until I do, stay curious and uh, keep exploring history, everybody. Uh, bye.